Chuck, can I borrow your bulletin for a second? Your bulletin? Thank you. I forgot to mention this earlier. That was an honest moment there. But um, if you are new with us this morning, there's a little tab on the side of the, the worship guide here. If you would not mind filling that out, this helps us as a church be effective in our communication to all of you when we're able to share what's going on or where you should park or different things like that, for instance. And um, if you wouldn't mind filling this out this morning, and as we leave, as we exit this morning, our ushers will have baskets in uh, back and be available for us just to drop those off. And that's going to help us as a church be uh, able to communicate effectively to, to all of you. Um, thank you again, as I said, um, for being here this morning and being a part of this. Um, this is an exciting time for me personally. Um, I know for so many of the people who have dreamed of this and who have invested in this and be a part of this, um, we're, we're excited for what God has in store for us as a community, what he wants to do here locally, and, and how he's going to ultimately use us for his kingdom, for the big things that God has, has planned. And it was interesting because I was thinking this week about, about how we relate to or think about God. And um, I don't know if you ever had one of those moments growing up, like where your mom said to you, uh, wait till your father gets home. Like, did, you ever, did you ever hear those words? Like, wait, wait till your father gets home. Like, he's going to deal with this. It's funny because um, my mom is here this morning, and my mom never waited till my father got home. <laughs> like, if, she, if something needed to be dealt with, she dealt with it right then. But occasionally you would you would hear that, this, this sense of like this foreboding arrival where, where justice is going to be passed out, where crimes will be punished, and where the guilty will be obliterated, like when dad gets home. But I was saying about that this week because I think so often we have a mindset, a similar view of God that kind of has this, this attitude, this understanding, this thinking about him that's like, wait till dad gets home. Wait, wait till he hears what you've done. Um, wait till he sees this. He's going to deal with this. This, this sort of cosmic force that is bent um, on making sure that we pay for our crime. Um, this morning, we are going to join the other Chapel Street Church campuses in a study that we've been a part of in our other two campuses since the beginning of the fall entitled, Jesus is Greater Than. It's a study of the book of, of Hebrews in the New Testament. So I want to just begin this morning by taking a few moments to consider and think about, provide a little of the background that's leading into this book of Hebrews. Because this is an ancient letter that was written some 2,000 years ago to a group of, of Jewish background believers who have now come to faith in Christ. So they grew up with this deep understanding of the Old Testament, of the Torah, of the law, of the practice of the Jewish faith, and yet at some point in time or another, they came to the conclusion that Jesus is ultimately their promised Messiah. And so as a result of this decision, they've placed their faith in Jesus and have chosen to follow him in their lives. However, this, this decision has not been without its consequences. Now, as a result of, of their faith, they are experiencing intense resistance, um, persecution even. In fact, as a result of, of this oppression, many are beginning to wonder now if they've gotten this wrong. How can Jesus be the Son of God? How, how can he be uh, the ruler of all things and and we as his followers, them as their followers, be under such intense attack all the time. I think they're asking themselves, how can we reconcile what we believe about Jesus with what we are experiencing in our lives, our circumstances? I think, I think it's a fair question. I think it's a question that, that continues to get asked in every generation when followers of Jesus are in the midst of trials and persecution. So now, in, in light of all of this, some of these people, perhaps many of them, are now considering abandoning their faith. Abandoning their faith in Jesus and returning to what they had previously known, their, 
their sort of old way of doing things, their old way of thinking, their old way of, of how they related to God prior to coming to faith in Jesus. So this is now the context of this letter. The author is speaking into this environment. He, who We don't know who this man or woman is that has written this book of Hebrews, but he wants to demonstrate why ultimately following Jesus even when it's in the midst of trial and oppression and pain, is ultimately superior to all other possibilities. Why, as he says over and over again, Jesus is greater? Hence the title, Jesus is greater than. So throughout this, this letter, he has systematically approached elements, values, components of their faith, their previous faith prior to Christ, and he begins to unpack them, and he begins to demonstrate or, or make his case for why Jesus is the superior option, the fulfillment of what they previously held to. Let me give you a couple examples. Right at the outset, in chapter 1, it talks about how Jesus is the greater word. He talks about how previously God would communicate to his people through their forefathers and, and through the prophets, but now... Even what they talked about, what they looked forward to, Jesus is the fulfillment of that. That he is the greater word. It talks about how Jesus is greater than the angels. In, in the uh, a first century Jewish mindset, there was a belief that it was angels who brought the law down to Moses. There was this really uh, emphasis placed on the importance of angels. But he says, but, but Jesus is greater than the angels. He even talks about how Jesus, the one who is greater than became less than, became one of us, took on the human experience in order to ultimately redeem us. He talks about how Jesus is even greater than Moses, which is no small statement to these people. He talks about how Moses had delivered the people out of their physical slavery when they're in Egypt, but Jesus came to deliver all people at all times out of their spiritual slavery. He says Jesus is greater talks about how Jesus offers a greater rest, how he puts an end to our spiritual striving because he's already accomplished the work on our behalf. He's done it for us. What remains for us is, is simply to put our faith and trust in him. And so here now, once again, the author is going to take yet another vital aspect of, of their faith, of their Jewish background prior to Christ, and he's going to demonstrate how Jesus is greater. And this is where we pick up the story now in Hebrews chapter 4. The very end of the chapter. Hebrews chapter 4. This is verses 14 through 16. He says, Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession." For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive and find grace to help in time of need. This passage begins here now, as he continues this process, he's going to demonstrate how Jesus is a greater high priest. A greater high priest. I have a friend who, who lives and works in the Middle East, in, in a Middle Eastern culture, and, and it's a very honor-based culture. And she was telling me that, that one of the things that she's experienced that was unfamiliar to her is that relationally, people who were at one time very, very close, very best friends, when there's some sort of offense that takes place in the relationship, one person has offended the other one, because they're such an honor-based culture that, that they completely split ways. They actually have a word for it that's like very similar to the word vomit. Like it's so disruptive in your life, um, this, this severing of relationships. She said almost exclusively without fail, these relationships are never restored. They never come back together. So with one exception, if there's some person, somebody, usually a family member that has a vested interest in, in this relationship, they can call in essentially someone who serves as a mediator, someone who is familiar with both of the parties and sits down with them 
independently and finds out what the core of the issue is and provides a plan, a path, to reconcile the relationship, to bring it, it back together. I don't think that in our culture we have exactly the equivalent of this. Uh, we have a tendency to kind of do our relational stuff almost in groups. Like we involve all kinds of people in, in our broken relationships and, and resolving our conflicts. But this idea in this Middle Eastern culture gives us a, a, a window into the role of the high priest as the people understood it that, that received this letter for the very first time. As people of Israel understood what, what a high priest was in, in the Old Testament. So prior to the arrival of Jesus, the role of the high priest, the position in their faith could hardly be overstated. The high priest was, was their mediator between the people of Israel and God. So it's their, their representative before a holy God. That was the role of the high priest. It was the role of the high priest in the Old Testament to enter into what was called the most holy place, the, the holy of holies in the temple, into the very presence of God. And on the day of atonement, the high priest would offer sacrifice as a payment for the sins of the people of Israel once a year. So now once again, the author is going to take something that's very familiar, very known and very important to the people, and he's going to demonstrate how Jesus is the superior high priest, how he is the fulfillment of that role for all people in all times, in all places. And not only does he describe it, this is the first time anywhere in the Bible that there's this role of the great high priest. It's not just the high priest, but Jesus is referred to as the great high priest, the ultimate high priest. So let's look back at the two verses that preceded what we see here in Hebrews chapter 4. This is now verse 12 and 13. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So verse 12 and 13 are basically saying, like, look, we, you can't hide. Like, all things are, are laid out in front of him. Like, we can't hide from his sight. These verses, if you just read 12 and 13 in isolation, like, it's ominous. Like, even frightening a little bit. Like, God, it's basically like, look, God sees everything. There's no hiding anything from him. But this is why verse 14 is so important. Because it's out of that context, and it says, but since we have such a great high priest... Jesus, the Son of God, who's gone to the very throne of God. Like, this is why this role is so important for us. This is why we hold fast to this confession. God knows the good, the bad, the ugly of our lives. There's no hiding it from him, but there is incredibly good news. We have a great high priest. He's saying to the people, you have a great high priest. Jesus has now become your mediator, the one who will represent us, who will intercede for us on behalf in front of a holy God. So let's think for a moment this morning. What, what makes someone an effective mediator? Like what, what is important in that role? Because ideally, if you think about it in terms of like marriage counseling or, or just any kind of relational sort of counseling work, Ideally, somebody entering into that role would have an understanding, an awareness of both sides, of both parties. And this is exactly the point that the author is making here in, in Hebrews, is that we have this in this, this perfect mediator. This is why Jesus is, is so effective. This is why he's called the great high priest, because he can relate to, to our struggles and our pain and our temptations everything that we have experienced in life. And it says, but he was without sin. Look at verse 15 once again. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Earlier in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, 
verse 17, it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. He had to become one of us so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. See, this is, this is why Jesus is so much greater. This is why he's so superior to, to the system and the means that we had available in, in the Old Testament. Because he became one of us, because he became, uh, he entered into our experience. He has the same struggles and temptations, and, but he did not fail. He did not sin. He never compromised, not, not in thought or in motivation or in action. He lived a perfect and, and spotless life. But now Jesus, the Son of God, is in the very presence of God the Father. And he's there to reconcile us, to restore our relationship with him. Because I messed it up. So this is different than, than how we think about mediation or, or, or uh, restoring relationships in the human context. I mean, as much as I might be uh, uh, at fault if I get in a fight with my wife, typically the way that we think, usually I am at fault when I get in a fight with my wife, but typically the way we think of it is like there's some portion of blame that we put on both parties, right? Like we both own, I could have done something differently or um, I could have seen this differently. Like there's, there's some onus that both of us has, but this is what's different here. This is all on me. This is 100% on me. And yet Jesus goes before in order to restore, to bring back, to put me back into relationship with the God who loves me so much. This is why we have a great high priest. And it talks about it here. It talks about this idea of response. Because we have Jesus as our great high priest, it says, so hold fast, let us hold fast our confession. What is our confession? What is he saying here? He's saying, hold fast to who you have decided you claim Jesus to be. Paul, in his letter to the church in Rome, says it this way, he describes this confession. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This was the confession, this Hebrew community that this writer is writing to. And he's saying, because you have such a great high priest, because of what he's done for you, what you know and you believe about Jesus, because it is in him and through them that we have been restored in relationship with God, he's saying, hold fast your confession. He's saying, this, this is the good news. Cling to it. The, the author of, of Hebrews is ultimately going to spend the next couple of chapters, and we'll look at this over the course of the next couple of weeks, but he's going to ultimately spend this time developing even further this priestly role of Jesus because, because it's so important in us gaining an understanding of what he ultimately came to do, what he accomplished on our behalf. But now, because we have this great high priest, we also gain a greater confidence, a greater confidence. I spoke earlier about that that whole notion of wait till your dad gets home, right? Like that thing that we experience as kids where there's this ominous presence of authority that's coming to, to mediate justice and, 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 and hand out punishment. But I was thinking about it on the flip side because now I don't think of it from the perspective of a child. I think of it from the perspective of, of a father. I think of it, the role that I have with, with my three daughters. And I think about even if, if they are in trouble, even if they've done something wrong, what would I want their response to be when, when I get there? Or I certainly at no time would want them to hide or to feel like they needed to, um, to be afraid of me. I mean, I want my kids to respect me, but I don't, I don't want them to fear me. Like, that's not my goal as their father. In fact, I would want just the opposite. Like, I would want them to come to me and say, Dad, this is, this is the issue, or this is the problem, or here's, here's where I went wrong. Can you help me with this? Can you, can you help me resolve this, or what can we do about this? And even if there are punishments or consequences or things like that that are involved, I don't want them to run from me. I want us to figure that out together. Like, in an ideal world, right, this is what the parenting-child relationship would look like. This is what we would hope things would happen. Now here we're beginning to capture in the context here just how different things are because Jesus is our great high priest. 
So throughout the Old Testament, if you've ever read the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, there are multiple examples for the people of Israel, for, for those who are serving as priests in the tabernacle, where they're warned about, about entering into the presence of God in an unworthy manner. In fact, it says pretty clearly that if you do so, that the offender would fall over dead. That you just, you cannot bring into the presence of God unholiness. Like it can't be reconciled together. So if, if any of us here are less than perfect, and most of us probably are, that's our condition. That was the state of things. So that could not enter into the presence of God. Even Moses, when he's up on Mount Sinai, this incredible leader of, of the people of Israel, and, and he's this uh, um, um, voice piece for God to to the people, and he says as he's receiving the law, God, can I, can I see your glory? In Exodus 33, God says no one can see the face of God and live. So he hides him. Remember, he hides him in the cleft of a rock, and he says he covers his face, and it says that the presence of God goes by, and it says that, he's, it says that he was allowed to see his back, literally meaning like the place where God just was. And that. That alone had such an impact on Moses that when he comes down from Mount Sinai, his face is literally glowing to where the point that the people of Israel are afraid. Like, what, what just happened to Moses? So that's the power of the presence of God. You did not take it lightly. It was, it was a big deal. But now, here in Hebrews, the author is clear. He says, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Let us with confidence draw near. That, that term there, throne of grace, that's a reference to the mercy seat that was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So like if you've ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Like you don't fool around with that thing. Like it was bad business. And he's saying, look with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. So what's changed? Like what is different? Why can we now with confidence draw near to the throne of grace? Because Jesus is our great high priest. Because Jesus has changed our standing, our relationship with God. And think of it this way. Prior to, to my confession in Jesus, basically what it's saying in, in verse 14, prior to acknowledging Jesus as, as Lord, believing in my heart that God raised him from the dead, my positional stance before God was one of opposition. That, that's sort of the, that's what sin does. That's kind of the definition of it. it. It puts me in opposition to a God. So that's my positionally, my stance in front of God is one of, of opposition. We don't think of it that way, but, but that's our reality. So therefore, the relationship between him and I was broken beyond my ability to restore, my ability to bring it back, and it was entirely my fault. Like, you, have you ever been in one of those situations where you have somebody who was once close or some relationship with you and it's so badly damaged you can't hardly stand to be in the same room together at the same time? Like, this is, this is my condition before a holy God. But we have a mediator one who has gone before us, one who will represent us, and he did more than that. He paid the penalty for my sin. He paid the penalty for us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says it this way. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. I actually like the way the New Living Translation translates this verse. It says, For God made Christ who never sinned, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And herein lies our confidence that in Jesus, because of Jesus, we are positionally no longer in a place of opposition. We're no longer in and in, in have this obstacle of sin that stands in the way between him and us. But now he's saying positionally, relationally, your position before creator God is that of children. And everything's different for our children. Like, think about how the, the, the confidence and the comfort that a child has when they find themselves in a place where they feel comfortable and secure. Like, they're, 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 they're them true selves, right? 
they come in and they're joyful. And, and I, I was thinking about this because my youngest daughter, Naomi, when this building was being built, I would, I would come over here and she would walk around and we would see the construction and see all the progress happening. And, and so she became very familiar with it. And the first time other people were coming, she was saying, well, maybe I can, maybe I can ask them or dad. It, it, she even said last week when we did our open house, she said, dad, can you, can you make an announcement that if anybody has any questions about where stuff is at or what's, you can send them over to me, like, you know. <laughs> Like, my nine-year-old will be here. If you got any questions where the bathrooms are or anything else, she'll, she'll help you solve that. Because she felt comfortable and secure in a place that was familiar. And this is what's being described to us about how we can now approach God. No longer in, in a place of opposition. No longer with this idea that wait till dad gets home. Like, he's going to drop the hammer. Well, he welcomes you in as his children with confidence. And ultimately, then, our greater confidence provides a greater access. Our greater confidence leads us to a greater access. Do you remember in the 1980s? I know some of you do not remember this, looking across the room, but <laughs> there was an advertising campaign that was put on by American Express where it says, membership has its privileges. There was a, there was a commercial where um, a, a man is like standing at an airline counter, and you can tell it's chaos, and people are running back and forth, and, and, and the lady at the counter says, well, there's only one seat left, and it's in first class, and he hands over his American Express card. Then he arrives at his destination, and everybody's trying to hail a cab, and, and there's a limo driver there, and he kind of like waves at him, and he hands him his American Express card, and he gets home, and he gets there in time to see his daughters play, and it's like membership has its privileges. I was like, that guy's just rich, you know? Like, <laughs> being, being rich seems to have its, its privileges. And here in this, in this text, the author now is basically saying, like, I want you to understand, I want you to get what this does for you, what this, what this provides for you. And he ultimately describes it this way. This is verse 16. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Grace and mercy to help in our time of need. This is this incredible benefit, this result of what Jesus provides for us as our greater high priest. So the question that remains for us is when is our time of need? Of course, I think we can, we can think about this provision in times of trial and suffering and difficulty in, in our lives, and we should. But I would not limit it to that. Rather, I, I think what the author is trying to say is this, is this is your reality. The need is our reality. He's saying this is available to you now at all times. It's, it's my everyday life. My need for his grace and his mercy never ends. He's saying, and now you have complete access, complete provision to what God has done on our behalf. Remember, as, as far as we know, as a result of this letter, as a result of what he's telling these people, their, their persecution, their suffering, like the problem doesn't go away. It doesn't just magically end. But what they received was the promise of a Savior who opens up the floodgates of God's grace and his mercy to them. And I was, I was thinking about this this week, just preparing for our conversation today. I was thinking about how unfortunate, how often it is when I lose sight of this. Moments when, when I live as though I don't have this kind of access, where, where this isn't available to me, where I, I seek to sort of serve as my own mediator. And I end up just multiplying my suffering. I just end up multiplying my own difficulty. See, ultimately, I think what the author is, is getting at here and, and, and what I take away from this message that he has for the people, it's like when I, when I think about when I find myself in a time of need, when I'm in the midst of, of struggle and weakness, which, that, again, that's our, that's our human reality. There's no sort of getting around that. What do I want in that moment? You want two things. I think we want somebody that understands. Somebody who can sympathize in, in our weakness. Somebody who can, has been tempted like we are in every way. 
And we want somebody who can do something about it. Somebody who can open up the access to, to all the grace, all the mercy that we're ever going to need. And he's saying, this is what you have available to you. This is what you have in Christ Jesus because he is your great high priest. Uh, this morning, as we're going to wrap up, um, one of the things that, that we like to do as a way of just kind of processing God's word together and, and, um, and responding to what, to what we've heard, to what we've experienced in worship, we call it just kind of a time of response. Um, our worship team is going to come back up here and they're going to lead us in one final song. And as they do, my encouragement to you would be to use this time as it benefits you the most. So whether that is, I just want to hear them sing and I want to receive this this morning, awesome. If you want to respond and worship and sing along with them, fantastic. Um, if you would like to pray, when the music starts, we have people that are on a prayer team and they're going to be some maybe down in the front and kind of along the side of the rooms. If you'd like somebody to just to pray with you, that's great. And a word on that real quick. Like we have a tendency to, to get uh, weirded out by that. Um, because we think, well, if I'm asking somebody to pray for me, then things are really bad, right? Like things are, it's, I'm at the end of my rope. And unfortunately, sometimes maybe that is true. But we're trying to build a culture here where it becomes incredibly normative for us to pray for each other. So if you have uh, a, an experience this week, like, hey, I would love for somebody to, to be praying about this week. Like, talk to one of these people. They, by the way, these are not like the spiritual superstars of the church either. Like, I've also had that notion in my head, like, these are the really, like, close to God people, and I don't want them to have to deal with my issues. Like, these people are just as messed up as you and I, and so that's why they're able to pray with us so effectively. So don't be afraid of them. If you'd like, like to pray with somebody, that's great as well. However it is, like, we just want to provide time just to listen to the Holy Spirit as we uh, process what we've heard from God's Word. So I'm going to pray for us. The worship team is going to come back, and then um, I'll come up and dismiss us this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you that we have in Jesus a great high priest, one who has made a way for us, who's made it possible to restore us back into relationship with you. So let us hold fast our confession that you are, in fact, the Son of God, that we believe in our heart that God raised you from the dead so that we too might be saved. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. As we, as we exit, I want to just sort of, again, introduce you to a couple of people. One is, as you leave, you're going to see people with a lanyard and a sign that simply says, Ask Me. These people are part of our welcome team. They're there to answer any questions that you may have about the church or programs or or groups that we have. If you're looking to connect to a small group or women's ministry or men's ministry, they can help you with that, um, along with, with almost any of us that, that um, have lanyards or we're here to, to help answer those questions for you. And if you are a middle school or a high school student, one, we're so glad you guys are here with us, but out in the lobby, you'll see a big blue sign that says Chapel Street Students. Some of our staff, I believe Gretchen is out there this morning, our, our director of high school ministries, and they want to connect with you to give you information about what's going on in, in the world of student ministries and the church and, and continue to plug you guys in. So make sure you stop by there as well. Now receive this morning's uh, benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, who came, who became one of us, so that he might be our great high priest to restore us once again back into relationship with you. We're so thankful. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.